week 13. This is actually the last week we'll be doing um, narrated slideshows from me. Uh, I'm going to post all of the student slideshows from next week, uh, and that'll be the class topic for the final week of the course, and then they'll just be the final exam on top of that. So musculoskeletal or musculoskeletal, as our friends to the north would call it. A. <laughs> hey. So let's start with something uh, fairly common and hospital-oriented. 90-year-old man fractures his left hip. He's got an inner trope fracture. He had a DHS screw two days ago, um, but he also has a history of prostate cancer. So what is an intertroch fracture? So um, when one has um, a fracture of the hip, can either be of the femoral neck, and if the femoral neck is involved, we worry about the blood flow because the blood flow kind of goes down here and then up into the head. If it's the greater trochanter to the lesser trochanter here, you have the option of doing a compression screw. And with a compression screw, they put the screw in here and then they put something along the side and then they tighten it down in and compress the two fragments together. It's not unusual with a head of the femur. So no matter what, if the, um, the neck is affected, you have to replace the head of the femur. We used to use an Austin Moore prosthesis. Uh, they sometimes use something called a bipolar prosthesis because it has uh, two different uh, components to it. Um, but very frequently now, they'll often do an actual total hip. The only difference between that is with a total hip, you have to actually also replace the acetabular component, the part in the pelvis. Uh, so they put a little plastic cap in there, they replace it, uh, and then those folks usually do pretty well. Now, obviously, it's a large insult to the system. It's a substantial surgery, and a small um, but meaningful percentage of these people have long-term confusion, and uh, some um, even die from the process. The death rate is actually, um, I think it's 10% or so, but... It's, it's not insubstantial. So, so what other kind of fractures can there be just to uh, review? Now, many times in primary care, you know, you're going to refer them, send them to the emergency room. Um, but a lot of us have the ability to do x-rays right in our office. Um, uh, we have a uh, um, x-ray department downstairs. And so uh, as long as a fracture is not an open fracture, what we used to call a compound fracture, which is a very old term, um, you can actually uh, splint it up and get it seen by ortho within a matter of a few days. There's no urgency. They don't have to go to the emergency room. Um, so again, if you can get an x-ray, if you can get them splinted up, you don't necessarily have to send them to the ER and you can save a lot of uh, time and aggravation. Now, um, I do orthoglass splinting. Um, that's something that uh, you, know, you have to figure out whether you'll develop those kinds of skills. Many ER nurses have that ability. Many walk-in uh, nurses have that ability, uh, as well as the nurse practitioners that work in those settings as well have those skills usually. Um, so a closed fracture, we used to call that a simple fracture, but many closed fractures aren't simple at all, are they? Comminuted means there's multiple fragments. You know, a regular fracture, there's just two fragments, one on each end. Comminuted, there's a bunch of little pieces. Complete fracture means it's all the way through the bone. Stable fracture means that you can see a crack in the bone, um, but that it hasn't moved. Um, that's also known as a non-displaced fracture. It's actually uh, interesting because a lot of patients discriminate between a broken bone and a fractured bone. Uh, from the professional perspective, there is no difference. Any broken bone is a fracture. Any fracture is a broken bone. So uh, any interruption to the integrity of the bone, uh, we consider to be equivalent. Um, but again, there's lots of other um, descriptions. Oblique means at an angle. Spiral means a twist. Um, you often see those in children where they have a twisting injury. Uh, there's various types of casts. We still do use plaster casts occasionally, although almost always we use fiberglass. Um, fiberglass can have a little bit more movement sometimes, so some of the old school people will still use plaster for certain things, although almost always you're going to see fiberglass casts. 
Callus is what forms in between the bones, often takes three or four weeks to really show up. Uh, and uh, with certain types of fracture, you're not even sure there's a fracture there until you see that callus. A reduction is putting the bones back into place. Um, so there's such a thing as a closed reduction where you don't open the uh, um, bone to the outside and you actually just take the two fragments and you move them around externally by holding on to the um, extremity usually. Um, some uh, ER docs will do this. Um, some NPs will do this if they work in that setting. Um, but the majority of these are going to be done by orthopedic surgeons. An open reduction is when they actually open up the uh, skin and look at the actual bones and reduce them. Almost always, if they're going to bother to open things up, they're going to screw a couple of screws in there or put a plate on or do something. And that's called internal fixation. So an ORIF is an open reduction and internal fixation. Um, uh, cast we just talked about, no idea why it's there about two times. Crepitus is when you're moving the bone and you hear that crunching. Um, crepitus can also occur uh, in other places. If you have a uh, um, pneumothorax, you can sometimes feel subcutaneous emphysema uh, and we'll call that crepitus. So any sensation of crunching, um, but again, if you have that sensation of crunching, it's much more likely to be a fracture. Um, compression fractures usually occur in the spine. Uh, we um, do try to diagnose those more often now because the kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty are pretty effective at decreasing the pain. So, <clears throat> um, you know, you'll want to be familiar with that terminology and that diagnosis. Impacted fractures when one portion of the bone drives into another portion, that can happen to the hip, that can happen a lot of places. And an external fixation device is uh, basically the erector set that you've seen on patients that have uh, um, pins drilled into a bone and then um, um, other pieces of metal that are um, screwed to them or bolted to them um, to hold it in position. So pediatric fractures. Um, uh, this is important to uh, remember mostly because you need to be aware of a Salter Harris type 1. Um, I'm going to actually, I'll, 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 you can look at this if you want to, but I think the diagrams are actually going to be easier to understand. In a Salter Harris 1, um, basically there's just a pull away from this growth plate. And interestingly, almost always they look like they have a fracture clinically. They're swollen, they're painful. The mechanism of action makes you think fracture, um, but the x-ray can often be read as negative because it's very hard to really see whether there's any separation of the epiphysis. Sometimes by doing a, an x-ray of the contralateral um, limb, you can actually see it, but very frequently you can't. So if it looks like a fracture and it acts like a fracture, usually we'll splint those up. Um, usually they'll be cast. Uh, and then they'll re-x-ray them in a few weeks to see if there's any callus formation because callus would have formed right here. Uh, and you'd say, yep, they had a fracture. Uh, sometimes when that happens, um, you'll take the uh, splint off in three or four days considering whether or not you want to cast them and they're completely normal. Well, in that case, they probably didn't have a fracture. Um, now, um, years ago, um, there was an old song in the uh, um, Three Stooges that was B-A-B, B-E-B. -B. So in this case, you're thinking M-E-Me. -me. Um, and so uh, Salter II is a metaphysis fracture. This is the metaphysis. This is the epiphyseal element. Um, and so in that case, you can see that there's a crack along this bone in the metaphysis. And... Um, and in uh, Salter 3, it's an epiphyseal fragment. And then in Salter 4, it's both metaphysis and epiphysis, M-E-M-E. -me. And then in Salter 5, it's actually a crush injury. And usually you'll see uh, some abnormalities here. It's usually a more substantial injury. Uh, there's narrowing of that epiphysis. Uh, Salter 5s are usually a pretty substantial fracture, so they're not usually that hard to figure out. So that's, um, that's the basic introduction to fractures. Let's talk about osteoporosis. So osteoporosis is decreased muscle, muscle 
I'm sorry, bone mass, and it is two standard deviations below the norm. You'll get two scores um, when you see a bone density score. You'll see the T score and you'll see the Z score. The T score is overall, the general population, and that's what we use for the criteria to define osteoporosis. The Z score compares people to people of their same age. Um, it's sometimes of use for the vast majority of us. All we're going to look at is the T-score. And if the T-score is below uh, two standard deviations, they've got osteoporosis. If it's below, um, um, I'm sorry, above one standard deviation, they get osteopenia. And so obviously those people have a higher risk of fracture. Um, what gives you risk to get osteoporosis? Smoking, female, whites and Asians, and thin. So this is one of the reasons that we worry about thin white women that are elderly. Um, they tend to have very thin bones. Uh, what can we do about it? Well, if the exercise is low, um, it will also increase the risk. Uh, the more weight bearing you get, the more strength you get to your bones. That's called Wolf's Law. Wolf's Law says the more you bear on your bones, the thicker they get. Steroid use should be avoided, and steroid use, of course, is a risk factor as well. Um, we do think, again, that maybe decreased vitamin D is a uh, risk factor. Um, there's a lot of speculation of what's going on with vitamin D. Um, uh, be very careful to take it as gospel. Um, we think that there's a lot of risk. We're not 100% sure. Uh, there's not a whole lot of evidence that uh, supplementing vitamin D does improve depression or any of the other things that, that uh, we thought it did when we first started noticing that people had low vitamin D levels. Um, we do uh, see some benefit as far as decreasing fractures though. Again, the problem is, is that if you go too high with vitamin D, you may actually suppress their parathyroid hormone and you may even cause them to have an increased risk of fractures. So. Uh, like I say, this is one of those stay tuned things. Um, don't assume that the more the better. Um, too much of a good thing is, is bad too. And then diabetes predisposes to osteoporosis as well. How do we treat osteoporosis? Now this is not a pharmacology course, but just to review, the bisphosphonates, there's an S in there, right? Most everybody spells it biphosphonates, but it is bisphosphonates. Uh, I'm embarrassed that it says biphosphonates here, but we did correct it just now. Uh, these are the most common. Uh, the challenge, of course, is, is that they decrease fractures by 2 to 5%. Uh, there is some association with some weird fractures where they have these um, uh, very pointy uh, um, femur fractures. Um, some people are very afraid of those um, and will decline the use of bisphosphonates. Um, but uh, they do seem to have some benefit in a subset of population. A lot of patients will opt to do exercise and weight bearing and things like that instead. Um, the CIRMs, the selective estrogen receptor modulators like Avista. Uh, estrogen, of course, does thicken bones. All estrogen does, but especially the CIRMs do as well. Prolia is in every six month injection. Uh, it's a rank ligand inhibitor. Uh, and it does seem to uh, decrease the amount of um, bone that's broken down. Uh, the challenge is, is that all three of these decrease bone breakdown. They don't increase bone production. So therefore, any bone that you have, even though you have more bone, is starting to get old. And that's why you get these weird femur fractures. That's why um, there is concern. Now the problem is, is that the uh, medicines that we've had previously that have increased bone growth have had a lot of side effects. Uh, the teripatide, the 40 is a parathormone, a parathyroid hormone analog. It's the first 34 amino acids uh, of parathyroid hormone. And again, it affects calcium metabolism. It affects all sorts of different things um, and can have some substantial side effects. Um, Avenity is a new monoclonal antibody that is intended to both stop the breakdown of bone, increase the buildup of bone. Um, the jury's still out on this one. Um, it's a relatively new medicine. Um, you know, ask me in a year or two how it's, uh, how it's going. I'll have a better idea. In five years, I'll have a really good idea. So 
uh, it does seem very promising at this time, um, but as I say, we're not really sure how this one's going to play out. So other orthopedic uh, and musculoskeletal complications, compartment syndrome is the big one that you want to remember. If you have somebody show up um, in the office or at the hospital and they have had some kind of distal leg trauma, doesn't have to be extensive, doesn't have to have been a fracture, um, and they have extreme pain way out of proportion, um, you know, often it'll even be unrelieved by narcotics. Um, often they'll have kind of a hard swelling near the anterior compartment, which is the portion just lateral to the uh, tibia when you're looking at that lower leg. Um, but um, it is um, something that is sometimes hard to palpate. You often can't feel it. Um, they often will have substantial pain with passive dorsiflexion of the great toe. The problem is, is that this compartment, that anterior compartment, does not have um, any arterial blood flow, which is weird because you would think that it would stop that blood flow out. So the pulses are usually intact. The problem is, is that once the pressure gets high enough, it'll exceed the, um, um, the systolic pressure sometimes. And at that point, you'll have enough pressure that you'll start to have necrosis. So they'll have a pulse till they don't. Um, by then, it's often too late, and they've had death of that anterior compartment. Uh, those folks, um, you know, will they won't usually die from this, um, but they'll often have the inability to um, dorsiflex their foot, pull up the toe, uh, and so often those folks will wear have to wear a dorsiflexion assist brace for the rest of their life. Um, it can be a big deal. The treatment is something called a fasciotomy, um, whereby an orthopedic surgeon cuts into the fascia of that compartment and opens it up and allows that pressure to be released. Shin splints might be a very mild compartment syndrome. I haven't read the latest literature, but for a long time they've talked about that being a possibility. Um, but uh, at any rate, um, the real compartment syndrome is something you really have to watch for. The lower leg is the most common place that you'll find that it can occur in the buttocks, pretty rare. Uh, it can occur in the forearm, um, which um, can happen um, even after birth. It's called Volkmann's ischemic contracture. Uh, so again, you need to be sensitive to any, um, any sense that if there's movement or pain uh, in a neonate with that, uh, you do need to be very aware of that possibility. Strains and sprains. So strains and sprains are stretches or rips of a ligament usually. Uh, tendons connect bone to muscle. Ligaments connect bone to bone. And so most strains and sprains are ligamentous. <clears throat> you can strain a tendon too. Um, you know, usually uh, it gets inflamed and we think of that as a tendonitis. Um, and the sprains and strains um, with those ligaments, uh, um, if, if you just have a stretch, uh, it's a grade one. If you have, you know, some fibers popped and everything, it's a higher grade. Uh, they can completely rip. Uh, and if you have a complete rupture of a, of a ligament, it'll usually have to be repaired. Um, but uh, you'll need to be familiar with the various locations of ligaments. There's uh, four major ligaments in the knee the anterior cruciate, the posterior cruciate, which basically form an X through the knee, uh, and then the medial collateral and the lateral collateral ligaments. There's the uh, deltoid ligament, which is on the uh, inside of the ankle. Uh, that can actually be a very problematic ligament to strain or sprain. Uh, the uh, anterior talofibular ligament uh, is the one on the outside of the ankle that very frequently strains if you roll your ankle. So musculoskeletal, um, besides x-rays and imaging, um, there are um, uh, blood tests that can be done. We're going to talk about some of the autoimmune tests that you can do uh, when we talk about the autoimmune problems in just a minute. Um, generally, there's not going to be a whole lot of lab findings with the simple stuff, um, but with the more complicated autoimmune processes, the labs can get very complicated. Uh, medicines for um, musculoskeletal problems, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines, 
very commonly used. COX-2 inhibitors do not uh, affect the stomach as much, so they're less likely to cause ulcers. That would be like celecoxib or Celebrex. Um, uh, steroids very commonly used for musculoskeletal problems. They're anti-inflammatory. They work great, um, but unfortunately, they also have um, more side effects than the NSAIDs. Uh, although, interestingly, the NSAIDs have cardiovascular issues that the steroids probably don't. Um, those are harder to pin on them because there's so much cardiovascular disease. Uh, it's easier to blame, you know, fractures later in life on steroid use when you're younger. The disease-modifying modifi anti-rheumatic drugs um, associated with uh, rheum rheumatic uh, rheumatoid arthritis and other rheumatic problems um, are um, anti-inflammatory, uh, work in a slightly different way, but there's also a lot of monoclonal antibodies that are being used for that now as well. So we're going to talk about uh, uh, several other musculoskeletal conditions, just to give you a smattering. Um, So lupus is autoimmune, uh, often has an elevated ANA, but I'll warn you, the ANA is one of the hardest lab tests to interpret. It's often elevated in um, normal people. It's, uh, you know, you have to know whether it's uh, speckled or not speckled, and it's very hard, and you spend a lot of time looking things up uh, when you have somebody that has an abnormal ANA. Uh, lupus affects the joints, skin, kidneys, blood, hearts, and lungs. Uh, it is a very difficult uh, diagnosis to make, uh, and actually these folks are kind of hard to take care of just because they have so many different uh, elements. Uh, there is a variation of lupus called discoid lupus. You need to be aware that that really doesn't cause any problems for any other system other than the skin. Uh, can cause a lot of scarring. Uh, Seal, the singer, um, who is um, British, so he's not obviously African-American since he's British. Um, usually in England, they refer to those folks as Afro-Caribbean. So, um, but Seal has discoid lupus, and that's what the scars on his face are from. Scleroderma, uh, also known as hard skin. Um, it uh, uh, also is known as systemic sclerosis. That's another autoimmune process. At least 100,000 people in the United States have the systemic version. A bunch of others have the more localized version. Pulmonary artery hypertension is common. The only way to diagnose it, that really is uh, with an echo for the vast majority, unless you have somebody that's in the hospital with a swan line or something. GI symptoms are common, especially dysphagia. Uh, and the ANA is also often abnormal in scleroderma. Any of these conditions, um, once you have these abnormalities, um, um, the, uh, I, I don't have a lot in here on rheumatoid arthritis, but with rheumatoid arthritis, you have red hot joints. Uh, you do laboratory testing, inflammatory markers such as the CRP and the SED rate are often up. Um, the confirmatory test um, for that, um, and, the, and the rheumatoid factor is often up, although not always. The confirmatory test for rheumatoid arthritis is really something called the anti-CCP. We used to have a lot of people that were clinically diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. We still do see that because there's some that have all the, all the symptoms without any positive blood tests, um, but the majority of people are actually anti-CCP positive. Um, so a lot of the rheumatologists are not excited to see people unless they have positive um, laboratory findings. Scleroderma is another one of these autoimmune processes. Uh, um, to be honest with you, right now, it's very hard to get somebody into a rheumatologist in southern Maine or uh, a little bit less so in uh, Seacoast, New Hampshire. Um, but, um, you know, it's very hard to diagnose these. And often as a uh, PCP, uh, I have to do a lot of this work up myself. Um, any of these patients um, are going to have uh, lots of symptoms, to be honest with you. Polymyalgia rheumatica uh, is a condition that uh, I really wasn't that aware of until I started seeing it fairly often in practice. These uh, usually, um, they're over 50. Uh, often it's worse in the 70s and 80s. They come in and they say, oh, I ache all over, my shoulders hurt. And people are like, oh, yeah, well, you know, they just ache, they're old. If you do a SED rate, very frequently the SED rate, which there's three or four different versions of the SED rate. 
One has a normal of 0 to 15, 0 to 20, 0 to 30. These people will be 60, 70, or even 80. They will have substantially elevated SED rates. Um, and you put them on a little bit of prednisone, just a very small dose of prednisone, 5 to 10 milligrams, and they will get substantially better. Um, a third of the cases are men, so it's still fairly common in men, but a little bit more common in women. Um, you do have to worry that they might have giant cell arteritis um, because there is probably a 10% crossover. Uh, we also call that temporal arteritis, so if they have a lot of uh, tenderness over their temporal arteries or if they're having a lot of headaches, uh, the thing you worry about with temporal arteritis is it can progress to blindness if it affects uh, the um, uh, arteries that uh, go to the eyes um, so that we do worry about that um, with that you're going to use higher doses of steroids um, but you do try to pay attention um, if they have a really high sed rate and temporal artery sensitivity very frequently we'll want to confirm that with a temporal artery biopsy interestingly that's sometimes done by vascular sometimes done by general surgery sometimes done by ophthalmology you actually have to figure out in your in your uh, your area who does those biopsies. Uh, morning stiffness is very common. Uh, we used to say morning stiffness was rheumatoid arthritis. We now know that osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease (DJD) can also cause a lot of morning stiffness, um, but uh, uh, it is something that you do pay attention to. Ankylosing spondylitis is actually exactly what it says it is. You actually start to have um, um, extra bone growth and even fusion of those vertebrae. Um, very frequently, they'll have an HLA B27. HLA stands for human leukocyte antigen, uh, and it's a certain one. Um, the majority of people with AS will have this. Um, most of them will have their onset under 45. Um, uh, we're using monoclonal antibody treatments now like we would for rheumatoid arthritis, which will not only help the symptoms, it'll actually stop the progression of the disease. Uh, so there is some real value to trying to diagnose this younger. Um, unfortunately, a lot of patients will come in and they'll ache. Well, it's your age. Well, if they're younger, it's like, well, maybe it's Lyme disease. Well, it could be Lyme disease, but it could be any one of a number of other things, too. Uh, people do a SED rate and a couple of other tests, and they'll go, oh, I didn't find anything. You probably have fibromyalgia. Live with it. Well, the problem is, is we often are missing the opportunity with a number of these people with these other joint diseases to uh, intervene early. So uh, the vertebral joints can actually fuse um, and they can have substantial problems. I have a gentleman right now that's got uh, inability to look above uh, about 80 degrees forward. He can't look above that. Uh, so we're now trying to see if we can get him down to Mass General to see if we can get some surgery done to try to improve his, um, his gaze. Uh, they do have a slightly increased risk of cardiovascular disease, so obviously those uh, folks do need ag aggressive um, monitoring of their um, um, cardiovascular status. Um, Sjogren's, which is Sika syndrome, not to be confused with um, Sika complex. Sika complex is decreased hearing and dry mouth. Um, but Sjogren's has elements of other autoimmune processes. Uh, very frequently, we talk about the extraglandular element. They'll have raynodes, rashes, and joints, um, joint problems, obviously, joint pain. Um, but there is another variation in which they'll have uh, um, uh, dry mouth, uh, dry eyes, interstitial cystitis, and uh, an increased risk of lymphoma. Um, they have fatigue, myalgia, and mild cognitive dysfunction. Again, this is one of those things where oftentimes those people are just uh, attributed to have fibromyalgia uh, or something like that. Um, you can do antibodies for um, SSA and SSB. Um, those may be positive, um, but it's not an easy diagnosis to make. It's a hard diagnosis to make. Uh, and there's a bunch of other things that can cause dry eyes and dry mouth. Patients will come in and say, I have Sjogren's syndrome, I have dry eyes and dry mouth. Um, but there is just the regular sicka complex. There's some IgG4 diseases. Sarcoidosis can do it. There's a whole bunch of different things that can do it. So it should kick in a, a pretty substantial differential diagnosis.
Marfians, you know, we think of those tall, skinny people, but really the element that we think about with Marfians is uh, the aorta because they can have a dissecting aneurysm, uh, they can blow out their aorta, um, they often have sudden death. So if you have somebody that's very tall, um, can put their um, hand around their wrist, um, has other elements that make you think of it, you may want to do an echocardiogram. Um, and or get them to an eye doctor to have their lens checked. Uh, their lens can actually completely displace. So it's a hard diagnosis to make as well. It does seem to be genetic, although genetic testing has not really advanced to the point where it's that helpful yet, but um, it can be an issue. So reactive arthritis, uh, also known as Reiter's syndrome. Now, it used to be we, we always said that somebody with Reiter's syndrome had a chlamydia infection. They got conjunctivitis, urethritis, uh, and uh, therefore they had to be treated for their chlamydia. And we do see that at least three to eight percent of those people that get the sexually transmitted infection, chlamydia trachomatis, uh, will, will get this. Um, but there's also people that get GI infections, Yersinia, Salmonella, Shigella, uh, E. coli, even people with uh, C. diff. Um, I was not aware until I was preparing this talk that we've changed the name from Clostridium to Clostridiodes, that's uh, my best guess at the pronunciation. And chlamydia pneumoniae uh, also have been added, um, uh, and I think that actually has also been renamed to chlamydophila uh, pneumoniae. Um, very common in young adults, or most common in young adults, um, and uh, they, they will often have an HLA B27 that's positive. Um, but usually, if you have somebody that has these, you just treat the underlying infection. Uh, or if it's an infection that's self-limiting, you know, like Salmonella or Shigella, um, you let it just get better on its own. You make sure they don't have chlamydia. Lyme disease is Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, if you have joint involvement, um, and again, this is going to be most common in the late spring and early summer when the nymphal stages are out there, but it can occur at any time during the year. Um, they will have uh, sometimes joint issues in that early disseminated process. Early disseminated is not that common. Usually the more localized EM type rash, flu-like illness, that kind of thing is fairly common. Uh, joint pain as part of the early presentation is not particularly common, um, but is a possibility. Um, remember, if you do the blood test, the blood test can take up to four to six weeks to turn positive. So if you have a presumptive diagnosis, many people will go ahead and just treat them, uh, figuring that the risk of uh, um, treatment with doxycycline is far less than the, the risk of Lyme disease. Um, but it is a bit of a harder diagnosis to make. Now, with later uh, Lyme-related uh, joint problems, you'll usually see red hot joints, uh, very often the knee. Um, very frequently, though, they won't have a lot of systemic symptoms with that. So it does make it a little bit harder to figure out. Uh, it's not all that unusual. I had a case recently uh, where orthopedics aspirated a joint, sent it for a Lyme disease test. It came back positive. So um, it is definitely a possibility when you have those red hot joints, especially the knee. Um, and, and again, a red hot joint usually is sent to orthopedics just because if there's an infection in the joint, uh, it's a big deal. So, you know, that's not something you want to fool around with or try oral antibiotics, just not done. Um, Post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome uh, is something that we're becoming progressively more aware of. The Infectious Disease Society of America and the Lyme literate uh, community are in a battle for domination in regards to whether um, somebody that has symptoms a year later has uh, chronic Lyme infection or whether they have post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. Uh, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome says that you had the infection, we treated the infection, the infection is gone. But while the infection was there, it caused some permanent damage to your immune system and possibly some of your joints and some other things. So that's a very different paradigm than chronic infection. Chronic infection says you got to do antibiotics, you got to, you know, use treatments that are going to get rid of the infection. Uh, part of the challenge is, is that a lot of the things that are used to treat chronic Lyme infection, like 
um, doxycycline are also great anti-inflammatory medicines, have a substantial anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, so even if it was PTLDS, they usually will make those people feel better. So um, not going to get into the whole controversy here, but uh, it is something that obviously you'll deal with with lots of patients over the years. Fibromyalgia, again, uh, we used to think this was predominantly psychiatric. We know that at least 50% of the people have anxiety or depression or around 50%. Uh, they'll often have fatigue, cognitive disturbances, psychiatric symptoms, and multiple somatic sim symptoms. So it's easy to think of this as a uh, um, somaticizing uh, psychiatric disorder. We now think that though that there's probably some central sensitization of the pain fibers in the nerves. Uh, we don't fully understand that yet. We know that around 2% of the population has fibromyalgia. Uh, and it can be very challenging for these people because the treatments are not terrific. Uh, we know that using gabapentin or pregabalin, which is uh, Lyrica, does seem to help a lot of them. Uh, and so it would seem to suggest that it actually is a pathology of the nerve fibers, um, but it's not clear what's going on. Uh, there used to be a criteria involving trigger points on the body and a certain number of those trigger points to make the diagnosis. That's pretty much gone um, since 2010 when the American College of Rheumatology changed the criteria uh, to include the following, uh, which is widespread pain, uh, symptoms have been present for at least three months, and that there's no other disorder that would um, explain the symptoms. I did include a diagram of the uh, trigger points or the tender points that we used to evaluate. Uh, just for historical context, um, there are still some clinicians out there that use this, um, but there is a newer uh, diagnosis and diagnostic criteria that you should be using. So mixed connective tissue disorders, um, there's a test called the RNP antibody. Uh, these are people that have elements of lupus, elements of scleroderma, and elements of polymyositis, but really can't be uh, put into any one of those categories. They may have a uh, high titer speckled ANA, um, and therefore uh, they should be reflexed to have an RNP antibody done. If that's positive, that's relatively specific for mixed uh, connective tissue disorders. Again, this is probably going to be mostly a uh, rheumatologist issue to figure out, um, but these are issues that uh, um, you definitely will see in clinical practice. So. Um, obviously didn't hit everything that we could hit, um, but you can only learn so much in one semester. I think this is enough uh, musculoskeletal stuff to wrestle with. Uh, I'll do the neuro talk and then we'll be uh, done with talks for the semester.